Hello there, my fellow sons and daughters of the dragon, and welcome back to some Battletech lore. After covering battle armor designs out of pretty much all the other major powers, I figured it was time to return to some of the great houses designs which I didn't get the first time around. Fortunately, one of these is the Draconis Combine, and as the title says, today we return with another three of their designs. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The first of today's designs is also probably the most well known. It is the Kage, massing at 3 quarters of a ton and a cost of 300,000 sea bells. The Kage, also supposedly meaning shadow in Japanese, is a light battle armor and also one of the first designs produced by the Combine after the truce of Tukaid. It was built for reconnaissance and battlefield infiltration. The development of the Kage was a joint operation between the Internal Security Force scientists and the Draconis Elite Strike Team Advisors, or DEST for short. Indeed, the Kage was meant to provide an alternative to the much respected DEST infiltration suit for missions in which DEST teams could expect a lot of opposition. Since production started on this thing in 3056, it has virtually replaced all the older models of the sneak suit. Working off on a failed prototype of the Raiden, research and development of the Kage began in March 3051, and the first prototype was unveiled in May 3052. However, it soon became apparent there was a problem in the design. The commanders had insisted upon a battle armor suit that could outjump many other battle mechs but a necessary jump configuration to achieve these distances meant it would have some highly unstable flight characteristics, which, in turn, led to the death of more than one test operator. Disaster was averted when the design team refined the jump controls and added a special partial wing and stabilizing fins, a modification that took another three and a half years to implement before mass production began. The end result was a great battlesuit, exceeding not only the original expectations, but also that of every other battle armor save the Sylph in its ability to travel through the air. The Kage has proven to be a success ever since it was introduced, used by both the DEST and the regular line units. One of the most famous early uses of the suit was as part of Task Force Serpent Strike Force against the Clan Smoke Jaguar homeworld of Hondras. Three teams of DEST troopers equipped with Kage suits infiltrated onto the planet's surface with the mission of knocking out the command and control center responsible for the planet's orbital defense. In this, they succeeded, overcoming the elementals guarding the facility and opening the way for the invasion fleet to continue the operation. Again, in 3069, a DEST team equipped with Kage suits was also responsible for rescuing Hohiro Kurita from the World of Blake during the Jihad. The Kage suit would continue to be used in the following years with new variants introduced as well. Since it was primarily geared towards intelligence gathering and covert operation, the Kage does not carry a particularly heavy weapon load. An anti-personnel weapon mount on the right forearm, typically equipped with a submachine gun, keeps both of the armored gloves free for other jobs. Within a Kage team, one of the four troopers is designated as the support element, and this one operates a single heavy weapon in place of the anti-personnel weapon. This can include a flamer, a small laser, a machine gun, or light tag. This weapon is carried into battle in pieces by each team member, thanks to their support squad weapon mount and then assembled prior to combat. Maybe the most standout feature of the Kage is the partial wing assembly, which allows it to make assisted jumps of up to 120 meters at a time and clear obstacles more than 24 meters in height. When not in use, the wing retracts in order to reduce the suit's visibility and signature. This mobility is enhanced even more by the suit's stealth features, 275 kilos of basic stealth armor. Although providing barely enough protection against a single hit out of a medium laser, it does incorporate aspects of a combination stealth suit with electronic and infrared suppression capabilities and it can run indefinitely thanks to integral rechargers. Not even a Beagle Active Probe can detect the Kage thanks to these features. On some rare occasions, the DEST squads will outfit their suits with extra equipment, 
including laser microphones, shotgun microphones, remote sensor dispensers, and ECM suites. Like many suits, the Kage normally requires the use of a special module to allow the wearer to slip easily into and out of the suit. However, given the nature of its designated missions, the Kage was specifically designed so that a person by themselves could get in and out of it as needed. And speaking of official factory variants, here are some of those. The Vibroclaw variant appeared on Lufian in 3069. It equips the Kage with a couple of Vibro Claws in place of the armored gloves of the standard model. Unfortunately, to make use for this alteration, the use of a support weapon or AP mount was lost. The Dest-specific Kage variant was introduced in 3059 and has a jumping distance of only 90 meters. Unlike the other Kage of the DCMS, however, every Kage equipped member of these squads carries a small laser. Finally, the Space variant was introduced in 3069. It uses a battle claw and a cutting torch to support boarding parties. For increased mobility, it carries jump boosters in the partial wing. The second of today's designs is the Raiden. I do apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. It masses one ton and costs 400,000 sea bills. The Raiden is the combine stake on the Inner Sphere Standard variant, which, although debiting first and also produced by the Kuritans themselves, represents an improvement on the design. Creation of the Raiden began in November 3050, after the combine's stunning success in the Battle of Walcott, which netted them a grand prize of 24 elemental battlesuits. The first prototype was produced in April of 3052 and presented before the coordinator Takashi Kurita in June for a trial. Unlike the early variants of the Inner Sphere standard, this prototype had both a decent ground speed and jump capability. Although the Federated Commonwealth was currently working on a redesigned standard which would match those attributes. It was armed with a small laser in the right arm and a shoulder-mounted single-shot SRM launcher. Most importantly, it mounted more armoring than the standard, thanks to a unique polymer bonding method, allowing it to survive a hit even from a medium laser and several missiles. However, the coordinator was unimpressed. He commanded the development team to rework the suit so it could survive a hit out of a large laser, and present the modified prototype for inspection within one year. He also commanded that the team's 70-year-old director, one Dr. Guffrey, should personally wear the suit during the next demonstration. Fortunately, the suit was ready after 9 months, and again it was demonstrated before the coordinator in a live fire exercise in February 3053. The team managed to get even more armor on the suit by removing the SRM launcher, which had the added benefit of improving balance too. Despite the fact that the director had neither the training nor power to properly control the Raiden, in a testament to his faith and loyalty to his leader, he did strap himself in and marched out onto the firing range. For the next few seconds, the suit would be engulfed in a firestorm of lasers and missiles. When that was over, miracle of miracles, the suit was still functional, albeit barely, and the scientist was still alive, even if in great pain. With an effort of will, he saluted the coordinator before collapsing and spent the next month in the hospital recovering. The coordinator did reward Dr. Guffrey's dedication by promoting him to be the head of the Internal Security Force Research and Development Department. And when he died just one year later, he was laid to rest by a Raiden Honor Guard. Full production of the suit began in January 3055. Just like the Inner Sphere Standard, the Raider has a modular weapon mount in the right arm that can take a small laser, a flamer, or a machine gun, to accommodate for preference or mission parameters. Also like the Standard, the mount can instead accept a couple of smaller secondary weapons, which are more suitable for anti-infantry work. It does lack the missile launcher and the anti-personnel weapon mount of the elemental battle armor it was based on. Although it does have the same jumping capacity of 90 meters, and also mounts a battle claw in the left arm. This enables it to hitch a ride on an Omnimech and make anti-mech attacks. As the boss wanted, the suit's 450 kilos of armor allow it to survive a hit out of a large laser, even an inner sphere large pulse laser, and still work. The suit is also stronger and possesses greater reflexes than the standard suit, 
features that improve its hand-to-hand -hand capabilities. Starting in 3056, the Raiden could also equip the Tsunami Heavy Ghost Rifle. And in 3064, during the Fedcom Civil War, engineers perfected a single-tube medium-range missile launcher with four reloads for it. The third and arguably the least glamorous of today's designs is the Oni, massing at one ton. Originally developed in the 32nd century as a replacement for the Raiden, the Oni was considered an ugly and generally unimpressive battlesuit by the majority of the Draconis military. Thus, it would be issued to either garrison units or units suffering the disfavor of the procurement department. While warriors of the Combine generally prefer honor and prestige over performance, the Oni has been generally unimpressive at both performance and looks. Which is kinda funny because I think it looks pretty cool. Maybe the most hampering aspect of the Oni is a lack of specialty. Where other suits fill specific capability roles, the Oni has no role other than standard battlefield performance. Outmatched in large battles or conflicts, and no faster than many other battlesuits of the same period, the Oni also suffers from supply issues. The Oni has been initially manufactured on both Lufian and Savinsville by Lufian Armor Works, with the intent, at least on paper, of using the modular weapon mount to enable it to be fitted with weapons that suited the prediction mission profiles, or the style of the demanding unit. However, the procurement department had a history of simply shipping the weapons it believes a unit needs, rather than responding to actual demands. That has resulted in a substantial grey market for weapons, as quartermasters work for their contacts to trade weapons back and forth. Despite problems with the Oni, perceived or actual, the suit continues to have a presence in militia units throughout the first half of the 32nd century. Partially, that is because of the clan spec fire resistant armor that the Oni mounts. The Oni also has an extended life support system and an ECM suite. The main weapon that the Oni possesses is the modular weapon mount fitted onto the right arm, designed to mount one of four main weapon systems. A Bear Hunter Super Heavy Auto Cannon with 20 rounds, a Medium Recoilless Rifle with 20 rounds, a Support PPC with 14 rounds, or a Compact Narc Launcher with 4 shots. The right arm is also equipped with a basic manipulator, while the left arm has a heavy Vibro Claw. And this, my friends, is what I wanted to tell you about these other Draconis Combine battle armor designs for today. With this episode, we're also getting quite close to the end of the Inner Sphere battle armor types. However, I'm not uploading these in the order I actually make them in, so it could be that there's still another 3 or 4 videos on the horizon. Regardless, what about you? Which one of these designs did you find the most interesting or militarily useful? Is any of them among your favorites? As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts on the models in the comments below. If you found the episode informative or entertaining, please leave a like, share and subscribe for future content. Until the next time, have a healthy and awesome day.